end soon. I'm not going to finish. Thank you. So I'm Steve Warby. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at the University of Texas at San Antonio. It's my third CISO gig. Uh, from 1999 to 2006, I was involved in the technical side of information security before I went to the dark side. There's two core takeaways I want you to leave with from this uh, presentation. One is that those that are responsible for information security, risk management, and compliance need access to information about where they are so they can determine where they want to go and they can develop and track a plan for getting there. And secondly, the information security to be effective requires that you go beyond the technical side and also focus on the people and processes as well. And I want to share a story with you about a phone conversation I actually did have yesterday. For the last few months, I've been getting phone calls from an electrical co-op that I've never done any business with. And I finally decided to give them a call back, got an automated system. It recognized the phone number I was calling from, and it gave me full access to the individual's account that I'm not at all associated with. And so my first, instinction, my first instinct was to change the phone number it was associated with the account so I would stop getting calls. Instead, I connected to a customer service rep, explained the problem. She said she couldn't help me because I wouldn't give her my name. I felt like there was no reason to give my name because it had nothing to do with what was going on. So long story short, she asked me to give her, give her my name so she could help me, so I just told her I was John Doe. And so that allowed me to get the problem solved. I, I also threatened to change the phone number of the system to the phone number for her office, so that got the, the wheels greased a little bit. So it was a people process and technology issue. Okay. So, I have a 10 person office at University of Texas San Antonio. We focus on policy, governance, risk management, threat management, system security, education, and consulting. We have a lot of tools. There's an example of some of them that are listed on the presentation. Uh, I also report to four people. I report directly to the provost, who's essentially the chief operating officer. Indirectly, I report to the CIO, the executive director of audit compliance and risk services, and the CISO for the UT uh, system. Does anyone in this room report to more than four people? Wow, I, I want to have drinks with a few of you that raise your hands. I'm really surprised. So it's good to know that uh, no matter what situation you're in, someone has it worse than you. So when I first got hired a little over a year ago, we were operating in a silo. Uh, tools were largely used independently. For example, attack data didn't trigger investigations of vulnerabilities. We couldn't tell you what our security posture looked like, and we had no idea whether we were better than where we were three months before. So one of my previous gigs was at the Virginia Department of Corrections, and what I'm trying to emphasize here is that not all organizations are the same. At the Virginia Department of Corrections, if we didn't handle our data appropriately, people could get harmed or could die. We also dealt with situations like inmates smuggling in phones in their anal cavities, uh, people running cables through walls across a 200-foot span so they could connect a isolated machine to the internet. We also had guards that covered their keychains in leather, leather flaps. Does anyone know why that is? So most people usually guess it's so no one could grab the keys. It's really so that no one could memorize the notches and the patterns on the keys so they could duplicate the key. Because in a correctional facility, someone has unlimited time to try to observe what a key looks like and duplicate it. Now I work in a university setting. It's completely at the opposite end of the spectrum. It's all about academic freedom, completely different. The Department of Corrections understood security. That's the business they were in. Uh, higher education generally doesn't understand information security, which makes the job a lot harder. Then we have organizations in between, like Zappos, I probably should have taken them out of the uh, presentation. Uh, so customers can lose money at Zappos, or they can suffer mental distress and file class action lawsuits. So I'm required to have a disclaimer, so here's my disclaimer. Um, I also, I never sign my own signature, so when I flew in yesterday, I ate at TGIF, and Smoocon was what my signature was. Um, I just use random shapes and make up words and no one's ever questioned it. 
And that's really my real disclaimer right there. Here's a few statistics about my organization to give you an idea of the scope of it. Uh, though we have 6,000 full-time equivalent employees, we really have 9,000 distinct employees because we have a lot of student workers and other part-time staff. And our user base really goes beyond our faculty, staff, and students. We have applicants, we have alumni, we work with the community, do a lot of outreach, and work with other organizations. So it's tens of thousands of additional users. Like most public research universities, our environment is heterogeneous. We have dozens of computer models, every OS under the sun. We have about 25% of our workstations are Macs. A lot of the Macs don't actually run OS X. They're just used as fancy machines to run Windows. Lots of VMs, lots of multi-boot. We have an unknown number of tablets. You name it, we have it. The IT and information security operation is largely centralized, but we have decentralized pockets. We also have areas of the organization that have no one that supports the IT whatsoever. And interestingly, a lot of the managers don't even realize no one's supporting their IT. To give you an example, a year ago, we didn't have any standards that required that operating systems be patched. We had no visibility into what machines were patched and were not patched, or very little visibility. And patching was handled a lot of different ways, sometimes centrally, sometimes by departmental IT, sometimes by individual end users, and sometimes people just thought their machines were being patched when they really weren't. So we took a number of steps to try to address these issues, including, including the development of a web-based man management tool called Insight, which is a tool I'm going to talk to you about today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the tool we developed and implemented helped address the problems we faced. I'm going to share lessons learned. And I'm going to talk about our future plans. This is one of the screenshots of this tool. We had two direct goals when we started the project in the spring. Primarily, we were interested in ensuring that managers who had largely been uninvolved with the management of technology and the protection of data were providing information so they could make informed decisions. We also wanted to ensure that central IT and information security had better visibility into the security posture of the organization. So for the project to be successful, there had to be standardization of tools and processes. It's infeasible in my group for us to allow 15 different antivirus tools, and we previously had a lot more than that. Uh, separate active directory domains without trust relationships, computers with no naming conventions, et cetera, et cetera. And we knew this would take a massive culture change, and we're in the midst of that right now. Uh, like I said, the managers were largely uninvolved in decision making before. It was something that IT people in the basement did. And ultimately, our, our end game is to improve our security posture, and make sure our techno technology is better managed. So this was a highly collaborative effort. We formed a team that was largely made up of IT, project management, and my staff. And a lot of effort went into the user interface design to ensure that it was simple and easy to use. Later on, we hoped to make it more granular, but we knew that it would be unsuccessful. We started off by biting off more than we could chew. In terms of the implementation, we didn't just launch it and hope it would be used. We knew that would fail. The CIO and I met with different groups, uh, governance groups, IT, managers across the organization, showed them what the tool was, how to use it, and most importantly, how it benefited them. We started small and we've grown since then. Uh, we launched it last April. So here's a network diagram. I didn't include any of the lines that connect the pieces because it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, on the left, we have machines that are outside the public internet. The system itself is firewalled off. You can't access it from outside on the internet unless you go through the VPN. The system is a web server running IIS. The application is a C-sharp ASP.NET app. Uh, it's accessible from anywhere on our network. To authenticate, users have to authenticate to AD. We have a central AD, not everybody actually utilizes it. And the systems that we pull data from, uh, we're using SSIS to pull the data from databases, middleware, and flat files. So some of the systems we work with include our ERP system for organizational hierarchy, uh, names and other information. We also have an asset tracking system that we use to physically inventory our systems. We have a number of configuration management tools. We actually have three of them. One is a VCM by VMware. 
we have SCCM by Microsoft, and we have Absolute Manage. That probably seems like a lot. The reason is we're trying to evaluate those tools and determine which ones are going to best meet our long-term needs. SCCM only works with Microsoft. VCM works with Microsoft and Linux and Unix. And Absolute Manage works with Microsoft, OS X, Android, and iOS. So we're trying to juggle those tools. So some of our systems have multiple agents pulling data from multiple tools. It's really fairly complicated. And in the future, we're going to be interfacing with more systems, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, we also have a backup and recovery, recovery system. It was mega upload. Did anyone else use that as your backup and recovery system? <laughs> so we had to stop using that, so now we use a system called Crash Planet. Okay. When a user authenticates to our system called Insight, the first thing they do is end up in our uh, indicator dashboard, and this is what it looks like. The screen that I'm showing is actually how it looks for me as I'm looking at the Office of Information Security. The most important piece are the six indicators at the bottom. It, and an indicator is really just another way of saying a statistic. Uh, the first one is computer categorization. That's used to ensure that managers tell the system whether the computer is being used by faculty or staff, is it being used for research, is it a shared system, is it in a lab, information like that, so we know how it's being used and can prioritize how we protect those systems. We also show them information on computer age. Now, just because 61% of my systems are over four years old, that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. We have a lot of systems that are old systems we use for test purposes, but for other managers, they previously had no clue how their systems were. So somebody could roll into their office and say, I can use your system, but it may be that they had one that was a year old. So now they have the data to make informed decisions about technology purchases. The computer reporting indicator is pulling from our configuration management systems. And this is really the key piece of all, and it really ties into all our other indicators. We had to make a choice between pulling a lot of our data from the computer, the configuration management tools, or from a whole array of other sources. So instead of determining whether machines on our Active Directory domain by querying Active Directory, we pull that from the computer reporting tool, which has the, the side effect as well of ensuring that if you want to have good information about your organization's assets and you want to look success successful, you need to ensure that you get our configuration management tool, our, our agents onto your system. So that was a strategic decision. We also have a computer protection indicator, which is essentially antivirus. So we're looking to see, do you have an authorized antivirus tool? Is it a recent virus engine? Are the updates recent? Is it set up to run on boot? And if so, then you get credit in the indicator for meeting those success metrics. And for laptops that are required to be encrypted, we also track that through our configuration management tool. I want to back up, actually. We, at the top, there's a delegate button. We initially made the system available to managers, but then quickly realized that managers sometimes want other people to assist them in this effort. So the delegate functionality allows them to add other individuals like administrative assistants or IT staff so they can have access to the tool, the tool and look at their uh, business unit's information. There's about 200 delegates currently in the system. There's also an admin tab that my staff and I have access to that primarily is used for us to process exemption requests. I'll talk about that later. So essentially it's a hierarchical system. You can keep drilling down. This is the view for the Dean of the College of Public Policy. The Dean has six departments underneath them. And you can see that for this particular indicator, this uh, Dean is actually doing pretty well. 92% of his machines have been properly categorized versus 68% for the organization overall. 90% is what our organization's goal is, and he can drill down and he can see how the rest of his direct reports are doing. If we drill down even one further lower, this takes us to the asset level, where the assets can actually be categorized. A green icon means that the machine's been categorized appropriately. A red icon means it's not been categorized appropriately. And you can see in the drop-down box, what's well, actually probably a little small for you to see, but the asset can be categorized in terms of whether it's primary, secondary, research, lab use, other. And the interesting thing is we're only required, our inventory department only requires assets over $500 to be inventory. 
which is a problem with things like iPads because a lot of them are $499. So we had to build additional functionality to allow for non-reportable assets to be inventoried separately through this system itself. So we have the capability to inventory things like network equipment, printers, routers, uh, storage devices, etc. Here's the detail level for another indicator. This one's our computer reporting indicator. In this particular case, it's also for, it's actually a different department. In this department, they have one machine that's not reporting, which it shows up as red. They have machines that show up as green, meaning they have the agent installed, it's reporting appropriately, and it's reported sometime in the last 90 days. Yellow is a warning, meaning the tool's installed, it's reported in the past, but it's been more than 90 days. So we use this information to assist departments in, in helping them keep everything straight and move in the right direction. Uh, I'm not going to show the laptop encryption indicator, but we have a number of supported encryption technologies, SafeBoot, BitLocker, TrueCrypt, and SecureDoc. So we pull that information from the configuration management tool. Uh, if they don't have the configuration management tool installed, they may have an encrypted laptop, but we'll never be able to show it as such within this uh, management dashboard. We also have an information page on all the indicators, which uh, shows information about how the indicator is calculated, how the manager can improve their percentage, any related policies and standards, Sometimes the improvement steps are things they can do, sometimes are things they can delegate, sometimes they're things that my office or IT have to take care of. This is the view for an individual asset. It shows all the indicators and some other information like the physical location of where the computer is. In the future, we're going to be making this information available to end users. They don't currently have the ability to see the uh, indicators for their own assets. Okay. The most important thing that our managers wanted that we didn't have at first was the ability to request an exemption. So they might have a laptop that never has confidential data on it, it never leaves a particular room, or it is incompatible with our tools. And so they can submit an exemption request, put in a justification. When they submit it, it sends them an email, it sends my office an email, it goes to a queue and we process it. And it maintains an audit log of all our exemptions. This has really streamlined a lot of our processes that used to take place on paper with physical signatures. So, reactions to our system have been a bit of a mixed bag. Um, some of the people want to make information security happen, which is fantastic. Probably the uh, most significant result is that managers thought that everything was magically perfect, but now they have information that tells them that's not always the case. And another unintended consequence that is that IT staff that may have had a free ride before uh, are being held accountable for their responsibilities. So they may have been telling their managers that they were patching machines and it may not turn out to actually be true. So now they're actually having to do some work they weren't doing before. I, I think the most interesting reaction we've gotten, and we've gotten this from more than one person, is the last one. Security is your job, we've heard. Why should I help you do your job? So that's a real big cultural issue that we have to overcome, is there's still a belief that security is something that we do, and a lot of folks don't really understand. It's not, it's not just technology, it's the people in the processes. We can't stop them from responding to a phishing email, leaving their laptop in an unlocked, unlocked vehicle. Those are, the, those are things they can control. In fact, I would say every single security incident I've been involved in in my career that I'm not responsible for, but I've responded to, has been related to a, a people or process failure. So we do have some carrots and we have some sticks. Uh, executive management, the CIO, have been able to encourage, encourage some managers to reach out to their peers who are doing well and ask them for advice and to emulate those people. So they'll tell somebody, hey, your, your, your colleague in physics is at 90% for laptop encryption. You're only, you're only at 30%. You might want to reach out to them to see how they're, so, how they're able to be so successful. We've also started to pursue tying discretionary IT funds to successful metrics. So if somebody is not encrypting their laptops and they don't have the configuration management tools installed and they ask us for funding to build a new computer lab, 
we've started to tell them you need to get your numbers up to improve your security posture if you want our money. And uh, I guess a carrot or a stick, depending on how you want to look at it. And we're, we're not trying to be too draconian with that because that will not work in our environment. We prefer to use communication and put things in front of the right governments, governance groups, so that executive management, executive management, other key constituents can assist us with moving forward so we're not the bad guys. So looking back at our project goals, I feel like we've largely been successful at this point. We, we do have a long ways to go. It's not a sprint, it's a it's a really it's a marathon. And our biggest challenge is going to be influencing our culture. It's uh, the, the pace of culture change, or really any change for that matter, in a university, I would say, is glacial. And so, yeah, culture is really definitely the, the biggest issue. We, we still have some folks, too, that have just chosen not to log into our system. They feel like it's somebody else's job, so that's been a hard sell. But most managers have access the system or, and are aware of it. We're trying to find ways to make it easier for them to stay on top of the information in this tool. Here's some of the lessons learned, and we've had a lot of them. Uh, garbage in equals garbage out. We found out that our inventory was entering serial numbers in wrong. We had tablets that were categorized as laptops because there is no category for uh, tablets in the inventory system. And that affects, affects things like laptop encryption. So we get exemption requests for iPads because they can't put our tools on them. Um, we've had to find ways to get units to realize that they're responsible for working with inventory to fix the serial numbers in the system. It's not an information security issue. It's an issue between management and the inventory group. Uh, sometimes a desktop is being used as a server. Sometimes a laptop is being used as a server. So the data is not always reliable. And uh, we didn't do the best job anticipating how the app would be used. So there were some lessons learned there. And really, really, really understand the business logic. We didn't do our best job with that. And so we're going back and we're fixing some things that were not ever set up right. In the future, we hope to make some changes to awareness, improving the scope, improving the functionality to ultimately build risk profiles. Here's some of the things we're doing in the awareness issue. Um, we feel like getting emails on a monthly basis in front of the managers will get the information from them so they don't have to proactively go into the tool. We're also going to expand access to all the employees. We want to get more devices in the system, pull data from threat management tools like our IDS and SIM tool. We're working on doing that. We also want to get information from our security and training system to find out who's completing security, where is training, and who isn't. We want more granularity so that we don't simply tell one person that your system doesn't meet our antivirus rules. We tell them it's because your system's not set up to run antivirus on boot. They currently don't have access to that level of detail. Some of the functionality we hope to include would be things like triggers, so that if we notice that a new service is running, we can trigger a notification to the appropriate IT personnel to ask them to tell us whether they intended to have that service running, and they can track it in the system to streamline a lot of our tracking. And we want to make the system easier to use. All right, this is my last slide. Essentially, we want to pull all this information together to create risk profiles based on devices, people, business units, and systems. And I'm just passing this on because I saw this on Twitter, and I thought this might be fairly informative if any of you want to pursue this. That's all. Now, we don't have that yet. We're hoping to be able to do that kind of analysis. We, don't, we haven't yet tied in any information related to security incidents or threat data, so we're not able to do that type of correlation, but we hope to be able to do that. So your questions about vulnerability scanning? 
So when you perform vulnerability scanning, it's not tied into the system yet, and it's previously largely been a checkbox activity. We run a scan, generate a report, we go to a business unit, they never create an action plan. We're at the point now where we actually get action plans back. What I hope to do is tie that into the system so that we can build up a risk profile. So right now we're largely looking at security controls. That's one of the pieces we hope to include. Executive management is never aware of it. 